thanks for taking the time today. Um, energy transition minerals. So we're listed on the ASX. And what I would say is that we are the most asymmetrical re investment opportunity of the junior sector in, on the ASX today, okay? We're listed, uh, our market cap is approximately 35 million US dollars. Let me go here. We've got about 15 million US dollars in cash in the bank. We've got no debt, and so that makes our enterprise value equivalent to approximately $20 million. And so that's the downside scenario. Right? On the upside scenario, and that's what I'd like to talk about today, is we own the license to explore and develop the largest rare earth deposit in the world, and that is the Quanifel project. Now, our company spent more than 10 years uh, exploring and developing this asset in Greenland with the support of successive governments. In terms of dollars invested by the company, that is uh, more than 150 million Australian dollars. And in December 2020, we received a confirmation from the then government that we could go ahead and apply for our mining license. So this project is shovel ready, okay? <clears throat> in early 2021, there were um, snap elections in Greenland and a coalition government took over and decided to enact a new law called Act 20, which has the effect of expropriating us out of that project. And so they did that for political reasons. Okay? And they used uranium as a reason to introduce a single uh, project legislation, essentially. Right? And so in, in a nutshell, what that Act 20 says is that um, any exploration project that uh, detects uranium in a concentration that is over 100 ppm cannot go ahead. For 13 years, they'd known that our project had 300 ppm, right? And so uh, that, that became the main reason. Um, so as a result, we initiated the dispute resolution mechanism that is enshrined in the uh, exploration license, which is international arbitration in the court of Copenhagen. Okay. And the respondents on that statement of claim are both governments, so government of Greenland, but also government of Denmark, because at the time of granting the license, Denmark was a party to this deal. Right? Now also Denmark is solvent, Greenland might not be. Um, as part of the statement of claim, and our focus is really the reinstatement of the mining license application, if that doesn't go ahead, we'll be seeking damages, and the guidance given by independent experts on the damages is $11.3 billion. I mean, this project is a complete outlier. Right? It's got a jock resource of 1.1 billion tons. It's got reserves, proven reserves, of more than 108 million tons. Um, the capex of this project is about 1.4 billion with an IRR of 21%, and the mine life is 37 years. Right? It's fair to say that of all the railroad projects out there, it's, um, it's the best in terms of size and potential. Right? <clears throat> now, the asset is located, as you can see there, in the southern part of Greenland, near the locality of Narsak, which is close to deep water fjords that have direct access to the North Atlantic Ocean. And Narsak is also 35 kilometers away from the nearest international airport, from, when, from where one can reach Denmark in, in less than five hours. And in terms of climate, the average temperature in Narsak ranges from 20 degrees to 50 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year. And so that makes it an asset that can be operated all year round. Right? Now, when in production, this asset could potentially be supplying up to 15% of the global market's need in rare earth. Okay? And obviously support the world's need for primary rare earth. It would also generate more than $22 billion of direct economic benefits to the Greenlandic economy. Right. So, you know, this project, in our opinion, has the potential to greatly strengthen local infrastructure, and the total impact on local economy would significantly exceed 
the estimated direct economic benefits. It's really, in terms of rare earth, the only project of its scale in the Western Hemisphere. In terms of uh, the uranium topic, so let's spend a little bit of time on that because that's really the reason used by the current government to stop the project. Um, the IA party took power on running on the platform of shutting down this project with a messaging that the uranium content inside Quenefeld was dangerous to the local community and dangerous to the environment. Um, now, we spent significant amount of money and time um, looking at the radiological impact. That was a key component of our environmental impact assessment. And that was basically conducted over a period of five years. We have 132 world, world class expert um, analysis reports that verify that Quanefeld is not dangerous to the local community, is not dangerous to the local environment. And that conclusion was specifically agreed and accepted by the government of Greenland in August 2020. It's just that by the following year, we had a completely different political landscape. So, um, you know, in terms of radiological impact assessment that was prepared by Arcadis, which is an international consulting company, it's got con extensive experience in evaluating environmental impact of uranium in mining, the Canadian. And their, their conclusion was that the project related doses originating from not recovering uranium content would not materially change. So in a nutshell, we believe we've got a very strong case for that asset. Now, um, in addition to the arbitration process, which is ongoing, uh, and where we expect a positive outcome, we are also expanding. We're not just sitting on our hands. And in uh, December 2022, we initiated a new exploration project where we're targeting lithium. And this time around in the region of Castilla and Leon, which is in Spain. Let me just forward. Uh, starting with a project called Vias Rubias. Now, um, we like Castilla and Leon. We think it's a top mining jurisdiction on many aspects. Politically, there is very strong support for the mining industry. And there's also a significant number of operating mining explorations right now, exploitations operating right now. And more importantly, Castilla and Leon is also home to um, a number of manufacturing uh, companies on the, uh, elec um, on the uh, vehicle side, right? Spain is the second largest manufacturer of vehicles in Europe, behind Germany. And just in Castilla and Leon, we've got Fiat, we've got Iveco, we've got Nissan that operates. We also have a number of energy company, Iberdrola, which is the largest Spanish electricity company, um, is also developing wind and power um, um, complexes. And so we expect that that ecosystem is going to evolve and it should enable a fully integrated supply chain for lithium in Spain. Now, the transaction we entered into in the case of Vias Rubias gives us the ability to take control stake in the project in exchange for supporting the first stage of exploration. We already conducted a drill campaign between March and July this year, which enabled us to get a better understanding of the property and its potential. We are now preparing phase two for this program, which will see us conduct a drill campaign of 7,500 meters. And the size of the license area is 11 square kilometers. So it's, it's very, very targeted. And the objective is to generate a maiden resource in Vias Rubias. Um, as part of our expansion strategy, we've also applied and we have now become pre-qualified to be granted four additional exploration licenses in the same area. Let me just, um, there in the small um, rectangle, down at the bottom, you can see the part of Spain where we're operating. And so that, um, Lic these licenses areas, they are near the frontiers that separate Portugal and Spain. Uh, these are pegmatite-rich fields, and we're also targeting lithium. Some of you may know that 
Portugal has accidentally become the largest producer of lithium in Europe. Uh, um, and, and this is coming from basically um, pegmatite fields where feldspar with high content of lithium, in some cases 2%, 3%, is essentially being mined. And so that is the Iberian py uh, Pyrex belt, that's how it's called, and we're operating on the Spanish side of the border. Right? So we've got uh, four uh, different license areas. They're called La Hinojosa, Aldea Davila, El Payo, and uh, Salva Leon. Three of them are in Castilla and Leon. The fourth one uh, is in Extremadura, near, uh, which is the same area or same region where Infinity Lithium operates. Now, once these licenses are fully granted, Energy Transition Minerals will own the largest portfolio of lithium exploration in Western Europe by size, okay? Close to 200 square kilometers. And our view, our, um, our theory is that we are, whilst we are likely to see upstream lithium projects coming up in Europe, we are unlikely to see very large projects of the size that you find in Argentina or in Chile, very simply because um, Europe is not uh, set up right now to host these type of projects. The policy um, and the messages we're getting from policymakers in Europe is that they'd like to see some effort in the upstream side of things, but not huge projects that uh, span you know, hundreds of kilometers, right? So it's really smaller size projects, it's, they're easier to permit, they're more acceptable from a social perspective, right? So, you know, for our company, in terms of news flow going forward, we think that the program of works in Vias Rubias, the development in Spain, that's gonna create significant news flows over the coming months. And we're also expecting the first response from the Greenland government on um, the statement of claim, which was filed in July, so that's six months later, right? We're looking at on or before January 2024. So I'd like to conclude this address by, again, remarking that ETM is really an asymmetric investment opportunity. Lots of upside, minimum downside. Thank you.